we're in Second Chronicles, Second Chronicles and chapter 21, where we begin tonight. As you remember, Jehoshaphat was a very good king. His, the son of Amaziah, he had initiated really a lot of spiritual reform. He sought the Lord for strength during his reign. He did a tremendous thing. However, Jehoshaphat had a fascination to observe evil. It caught up to him. More than, light, more than that, it caught up to his children. And the Bible tells us as he wanted to go up north to see what was going on there in the, king, in the kingdom there in Israel, he wanted to venture up and partner up with them. And actually, we saw last week towards the end where he had made a league with the northern kingdom. But doesn't the Bible tells us that we should not be unequally yoked with unbelievers? There's something about that, isn't there? It just doesn't work. Now, I'm not just talking about a husband and relationship where a couple would come to me and say, we want to get married. And normally the first thing I say, are you both believers? Well, anytime they say, well, I go, oh, oh, time out here a second. That's not going to work. And, you know, even though much, how much you attracted, you need to become born again, Joe or, or, or Sally, whatever, whoever it was, and receive Jesus Christ because there's a spiritual dynamic in, in our relationship that we need to have. And, and so it's true in life. It, as certainly him being king, trying to make a league with the northern kingdom, it, the price was going to, it, it's going to be paid, and we'll see it here. In verse 1, And Jehoshaphat slept with his fathers and was buried with his fathers in the city of David. And Jehoram, his son, reigned in his stead. And he had brethren, the son of Jehoshaphat, and he names them there in verse 2. In verse 3, And their father gave them great gifts of silver and of gold and of precious things with fenced cities in Judah. But the kingdom he gave to Jehoram because he was the firstborn. So apparently all these cities throughout the land, he had given it to him sons, like mayors of the city, where they were all set up in, in a pretty good place. But they gave it to his firstborn, the place that where he could reign as being king. And now when Joham was risen up in the kingdom of his father, he strengthened himself and slew all of his brethren with the sword and, and diverse all, also all the princes of Israel. What a nice guy, right? He came in power, and all these other guys seemed to be a threat to them. And so what are you going to do? Instead of sitting down talking to the guys and, you know, spending time with them, they're your family, you figure you can work things out. Isn't it? Don't all families always work out their squabbles? No, it doesn't quite work that way, right? And so this guy, instead of working things out or trying, they pulled out the sword and they started, of course, you know, stabbing each other. You know, he used to, Jehoram, used to venture north with his dad. He would go up there as his dad wanted to go hang out with Ahab, and they wanted to have times together. And, you know, he would see all the evil, all the wickedness, and really all the lewd acts that were going on up there in, in the northern part of Israel. And the thing is, as he was observing these things, he was entertained by the different women up there. As him being a very young guy, 17 at, of age, he was introduced to the daughter of Jezebel. You remember Jezebel? You could say boo if you want. She was a very, very wicked woman. She was the wife of Ahab, who the ruler of the north, that was truly the most wicked ruler of the north that I had seen up to this time. And falling in love with Ahithliab, the daughter, when they were 17 years old, they got married. Maybe some of you guys got married when you were 17 years old, but you fall in love, and it doesn't matter anything. We're going to get married, and they got married, and they started heading down, back down to Judah, and they're as married teenagers. In fact, they had their first child uh, when they were when he was 18 years old. So got married, had a baby, and that's what was happened. But seeing these things that his dad had taken him to see. Remember what we saw, saw or we read last week where Jehoshaphat, as he went, he said all he did was observe. But, you know, it doesn't quite 
work that way because the things that we allow into our lives a lot of times can affect other people. Your life does affect people that come in contact with you for good and for bad. The Bible tells us that we're an open book known and read of all men. And so as their dad was looking at these really awful things that were happening in the northern kingdom, not realizing his son was being influenced being drawn into it, where ultimately he married the, the daughter of Jezebel. And Jehoram, in verse 5, was 30 and 2 years old when he began to reign, and he reigned 8 years in Jerusalem. He had a, really a short reign. He died at the age of 40 years old when he was, his death came on him. In verse 6, And he walked in the ways of the king of Israel, as did the house of Ahab, for he, he had a daughter of Ahab's to wife, and he wrought the which, which was evil in the eyes of the Lord. He turned his back from the Lord. This young king, the, the son of the, uh, Jeroho, uh, that we saw here, his name is uh, Jehoham. He was introduced to, to Baal worship up there, and it felt, talks about how actually the history tells us what he did. Can you picture the Solomon's temple in all of its glory and the wonder that we've seen, we've seen up to this point, that this fellow moved the, the temple of Baal right next to the temple of the Lord. He had not only was so influenced by it, he wanted to start the, you know, worshiping there in Baal, and he led the nation into this worship, and he brought the priests of Baal there to Jerusalem, and he did that which was evil in the house of the Lord. However, as we know in verse 7, that the Lord would not destroy the house of David. See, he was a descendant of David, and because of that, he will not destroy the house of David. Why is that? Because the promise that God made, right? That through his line, through his lineage, that, that the, the Messiah would come. So the Lord would not destroy the house of David because he had made a covenant with David. And he promised to give a light to David and his son to reign forever. Of course, the covenant that God made with David wasn't going to change it wasn't going to, God's not a man. I love it that God's not a man that he should lie. It's a covenant that's sure. It's a promise that, that we could trust on, trust in, even though sometimes people might be unfaithful. God's not. His word is not. Uh, is not. And truly tonight that brings comfort to me, is God honors his comfort and covenants even to us. He's God is faithful to his word, and he keeps his word. Even though people often fail, the Word of God never, ever fails, not one bit at all. You can take the promises of God, and you can count on them. And I love it where Jesus says to us, the promises. Don't you love the promises that Jesus speaks to us? He says one thing he says to us even tonight. He says, peace I leave unto thee, peace I give unto thee, not as the world give that I give, not the way the world gives. This peace I give unto thee. That's a promise that God gives. Have you guys experienced that peace this week? Do you have peace? Or this past week? And, you know, on, here on Sunday, I have made mention to it, but last Tuesday, about 3 o'clock in the afternoon, I was going north on Brookhurst and heading home after going to Stater Brothers, and, and I was st stopped right there in Edinger, watch, waiting for the red light to, to turn, and not, not knowing it to me, all of a sudden, this Mercedes coupe decided to come full board in the back of my truck. I don't know why I wanted to do that, but he came full board with hit, without hitting its skid marks and all that. Next thing I knew, I went flying, and I went, whoa, you know, and I, I missed the, head, the, the steering wheel and everything else. That poor Mercedes got totally crunched. My truck went like an accordion, went up and all that. And all the time, even as I got out of the car, I was dazed like we should be dazed. You know what I had? Peace. Even through that, that tremendous peace that came upon me. See, that's the promise of God. It doesn't change. 
he'll take us through no matter what we go through. He, you know, there, you know, I got little things going on with my body and back and different things like that. But God will see me through that, right? And that's what we have to see is, is understand no matter how bad the world might get. And here's this guy's being pretty bad, setting up the, the temple of Baal right there at Jerusalem. God has a plan. Verse 8. In the days the Enamites revolted underneath the dominion of Judah and made themselves a king. And then Jeroham went forth with his princesses and all of his chariots and with him. And he arose up by night and smote the Edomites, which compassed him in, and the captains and the chariots. So the Edomites revolted from under the hand of Judah unto this day. And the same time also did Libna revolt from under his hand. Because why? He had forsaken the Lord God, his father. You know, the thing is, underneath Jehoshaphat, his dad, he had peace on it, all borders. Because he did not serve the Lord, he wasn't able to experience that peace. Real simple, isn't it? If you serve the Lord, one of the byproducts you're going to have is rest and peace. Do you guys have rest and peace about your future? You have because you're serving our king. You know that he has our, our future in his hands, and we can understand that. God had over and over said to the kings of Israel, If you seek me, I will be found of you. If you forsake me, I will forsake you. We know that even true today. I cannot walk away from God and the things of God and expect God to continue to give me divine protection. I can move myself out of the hand of God, out of the hands of God's protection and love and grace if I choose to rebel against him. Jude been writing his little epistle. It's a great read. It's something that, you know, it's only one chapter, but it's, it's a beautiful book to be able to read. He tells us in Jude, he says, keep yourself in the love of God. Strong exhortation that he gives us there that we keep ourselves in a place where God can protect you, keep you in a place where God will pour out his blessing upon you. And I think it's so important that we keep ourselves in the love of God where God will keep us and take care of us. Jude points out with examples of the nation of Israel who had experienced deliverance of God from bondage in Egypt and never ever did enter into the full blessings of God. You ever notice that when you're studying Joshua and as you go through the Old Testament, they never enter in the full blessing of God. You know why they didn't receive the full blessings of God? It tells us because of unbelief. They didn't believe God's promises. They didn't trust in God's word. And I sometimes wonder in my own life, Lord, am I falling short of all that you want to give me? Because of my unbelief. Like that one disciple says, Lord, I believe, but please help me with my unbelief. You know, there's an area of doubt that sometimes creep in. And the way you make doubt disappear is through the Word of God. Because the Bible tells us that faith comes from where? Faith comes from hearing and hearing the Word of God. As you gather on Sunday night, I commend you for coming out and giving your time to set aside so you can hear the Word of God. And it's my prayer as you go home each week that your faith would grow. As you study God's Word on your own, that your faith will continue to grow. And that's what they were missing and I believe one of the key areas that we, as we grow, as we keep ourselves in the love of God. And verse 11, Moreover, he made high places in the mountains of Judah and caused the inhabitants of Jerusalem to commit fornication and compel Judah thereto. He ordered them to worship pagan deities. Of course, this is spiritual fornication that you see here. You know, where they were starting to worship other gods that aren't gods. I think the Bible, we've always all read it so many times. They would make these images. They would make their statues. They would have ears, but they couldn't hear. 
They had eyes, but they couldn't see. They had a mouth, but they couldn't taste. But they have arms, but what? Their arms are too short to help when you need help. Who are you going to call on if you're sick? Who are you going to call when you need help? Won't you want to call to the living God that's able to help them? But yet, he says, he made high places. And these high places, as we studied before, were up in the hills around Jerusalem and throughout Judah where they would practice terrible pagan ceremonies uh, that were just really terrible. And yet he did it. In verse 12, And there came a writing to him from Elijah the prophet. Oh, you know, as we get further along, so we'll be pointing out how a lot of these prophets are, are actually living and functioning during the time of this rebellion and all that's going on. And this was Elijah. Is Elijah a guy that you think you would want to mess with? Not me. Neither one of the guys. And, and he said, that, and he's saying, Thus says the Lord God of David, my father, because thou hast not walked in the ways of, of Jehoshaphat the father, nor in the way of Asa the king of Judah. And so now he's telling him, he says, but, but has walked in the ways of the king of Israel and has made Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem to go, to go a horn like the whoredom of the house of Ahab and, has, and also have slain thy brethren and thy father's house which were better than thyself. Even though Elijah wasn't there, he wasn't there. As he tells them, see, it tells us here that he said that he, he came, there came a writing. He wrote something by a messenger. He was aware of what was going on because, you know, he, this is the guy that could see the unseen. Elijah could see what was going on, and as he heard from the Lord, he, he wrote this down, and he sent it to, to, this, to this king. And you would think that a king, if you got a word from Elijah, if you got it in an email or you got a letter, postmark, certified mail from Elijah, do you think you would pay attention to it? I know I would. Especially the things that you he had said, you figured, okay, I'm gonna, I better, I re, better repent. This is serious business. Verse fourteen: Behold, with a great plague, with the Lord smite thy people and thy children and thy wife and all thy goods, and thou shalt have a great sickness by the disease and thy balls until the balls fall out by reason of sickness day by day. Moreover, the Lord stirred up against Jehoram the spirit of the Philistines, uh, the Arabians, and that were near the Ethiopian. He's bringing calamity onto himself. He didn't have to go down that road. And that's, I think, is so important to see. Sin has a price that people have to pay. If, when they choose to rebel, uh, the, what we mentioned here before, where Paul writes in the book of Galatians, if you so to the flesh, of the flesh, you'll reap what? You'll reap corruption. It, it will catch up to you. If you sow to the Spirit, of the Spirit, you'll reap everlasting life. It's a simple choice. It's a spiritual law that you can't fight against. It's truth. And so here he says, not only are you going to have a physical problem, but you're going to have battles from all around and they came up to Judah, verse 17, and break into it and carried away all their su the substance that were found in the king's house and the sons also and his wives, that, that, uh, that there was never a son left uh, save Jehoaz, Jehoaz, the youngest of his sons. And after the Lord smote him with balls with, with an incurable disease, and we don't know, of course, what it was, it came to pass that in the process of time, after the end of two years, his balls fell out by reckonness, uh, reason of his sickness, and he died of sore disease. And all the people made no burning on him like the burning of his fathers. What is it? The Bible is so graphic. It really lays it out the way it is. When you mess with God, it's not a good thing. And this this last little phrase like the burning of his fathers of course what they would do when somebody would die you know especially today of uh, uh some dig dignitary somebody of state would die they you know you know some king or whatever they would make a huge ceremony and everybody would see it 
what they would, at this time, if a king would die, they would take him to the place, they would make this big bonfire, and everybody would come and, you know, around and have their last time for the, with the king. And they said, this guy so led us in such destruction, he says, we're not going to have a bonfire. We're not going to, you know, honor this man in any way. And it says, I'm 30 and two years old was he uh, when he began to reign, and he reigned in Jerusalem eight years and departed without being uh, being de desired. Albeit they did bury him in the, in the city of David, but not in a sepulcher of the kings. He it wasn't even going to be put in with the sepulchers of the king. And it tells us now the inhabitants of Jerusalem made Ahazai, the youngest son king, in his stead. For the band of men came to, with the uh, Arabians to camp to slain all the elders. And Ahazai, the son of Jehoram, the king of Judah, reigned. Forty and two years was Ahazai when he began to reign. And he reigned one year in Jerusalem. And his ma mo mother's name was also Athithaliah, the daughter of Omri. And he walked in the ways of Ahab, for his mother was his counselor to do wickedly. So his mom, coming from the north, learning all the practices of Baal, had a strong influence on her son. We all, as not only as parents, as grandparents and aunt and uncles and kids we come in contact with, we have an opportunity to influence people for the good and the gospel. I would encourage you to develop a prayer list, to pray for your family members, even your distant cousins and relatives, that they might know Jesus Christ. You know, I read the story and hear the story of John and Charles Wesley and the marvelous work that they did. But you know what they always attributed to? Was their godly mother that they had over them. I remember driving along uh, through Santa Ana with my pastor, Pastor Chuck Smith, and him taking me down the street, say, that's where my mom used to live, raising me, and where we used to hang out. And as we went up to Ventura, he, would, he took me by where they grew up. And he was almost still, you know, in his 80s, would have tears in his eyes because of the godly influence that his mother had over his life. We can make a difference with the people that God puts in our life. And I don't know who the Lord puts in, has in your life right now or maybe in the near future. But as you pray for them, as you just be real around them, as you demonstrate the love of Jesus Christ. And one of the things that I find, I, I have two children, what they're looking for from me and my wife, or for us just to be real. They never look for me to be pastor dad, right? Or be like some re religious nut. They're looking for dad to love them. And for me to pass on the grace of God that I know, as we know freely, freely we have received. What have we received as, as, as husbands, as wife, as parents, as to aunts and uncles, and all that we have, but the grace of God, that we would pass it on. But in our story, this mother... She was so wicked that the influence of this mom really swayed this young man, while well, he wasn't young at this time, to do that which was evil there in Judah. Verse 4, Wherefore he did evil in the sight of the Lord like the house of Ahab, for, for they were his counselors after the death of his father, um, his destruction. You know, also one point on there is that be careful who you counsel with to make sure you find godly counsel. Amen. The greatest counsel that you can have is the Word of God that you find in it. One of the things over the years that I discovered with my pastor, and I, he, says, I don't, he says, I don't like counseling. I go, well, that's kind of strange. I thought that's what we're supposed to do. No, and my other good friend, a guy named Romain, used to say the same thing to me. All I do is try to point people back to the Word of God in prayer. 
the great counsel that we get is found there and from Genesis through Revelation. But as the Bible tells us that there's safety in a multitude of counsel, that you find by biblical people who will show you the same thing in the Word of God and what needs to be done. And it tells us in verse 5 that he walked also after the councils and went with Jehoram, the son of Ahab, the king of Israel, to war with Heziel, the king of Syria, at Ramoth Gilead. And the Syrians smote Joham, and he returned to be healed in Jezreel because of the wounds which were given him at Ramoth when he fought with Hezarel, the king of Syria, and Ezariah, the son of Jehoram, the king of Judah, went down to see uh, Jehoram and the son of Ahab the, at Jezreel because he was sick. Of course, Jehoram was actually his un uncle, and he was the brother of Ahithelel, the, this, I mean, this woman. And, and verse 7, And the destruction of Ahazai, was of God by the coming of Joram. For when he was come, he went out with Joram against Jehu, the son of Nishri, whom the Lord had anointed to cut off the house of Ahab. God's even in control of the wars that are going on, and the things that were going on here in our story. And it came to pass that when Jehu was executed, executed judgment upon the house of Ahab and found the princes of Judah and the sons of the brethren of Ahazai, the minister of Ahazai. He slew them, and he sought Ahazai, and he caught him, for he was hid in Samaria, and he brought him to Jehu. And when he had slain him, they buried him, because, uh, said they, he, he is the son of Jehoshaphat, who sought the Lord with all of his house. So the house of Ahazai had no more power to keep still in the kingdom. And with Alethea, the mother of Ahazai, saw her son was dead, she arose and destroyed all the seed of the royal house of Judah. So this wicked woman in our story, seeing all of this going on, she could control her son, but she wanted power, didn't she? And so she decided to, to destroy all the royal seed of Judah. One of the things that I find it's interesting, one of the tactics of, of Satan, and we'll get it later on in the book of Esther, or, uh, I mean, as we, we go through and we study these various books, he was always trying to destroy the line of, of, that Jesus was going to be born in. And if he could wipe out completely this house, he could destroy the lineage of David. And it, but it tells us here that uh, Jehoshaphat, the, and here uh, we got a lot of these Jehoshaphat people, the daughter of the king took Joaz, the son of Ahaziah, and stole him from the, among the king's son that was slain, and put him and his nurse in a bed, bedchamber. Jehoshaphat, the daughter of the king of Joam, the king of Jehoadai, uh, the priest, for she was the sister of Ahaziah, hid from uh, Lithia, if, so that she slew him not. And he w was with them and hid in the house for of God six years, until the, as the rain as a Hithel reigned in the land. A year old, this one boy was still that she didn't get. Isn't this interesting? You wonder how can you be used of the Lord? Here's this daughter, this gal, grabs this boy, said, "This is going to happen to him." Runs into the temple and hides this boy into the temple. There's six years. Chapter 23, as we'll take a look at it next week, it's a great chapter because this wicked woman gets what come, is coming to her. But God preserves the lineage. God preserved his promise that he made to David that through him that all the, all the nations would be blessed, that you could find that promise out a thousand years earlier to Abraham that he made, and that we are standing here right now because that promise came true. As this young boy that was one year old was preserved, and next year we'll see this young boy being seven years old becoming king that God starts to do his work through him. Marvelous, isn't it? The promises of God. Why don't we go to the Lord in prayer and we'll pick it up next week. Father, we thank you as we look at this story and 
And as even as I was coming over here, I was praying, Lord, help us all to glean through, glean something from this, all the tragedies going on. It's hard to keep track of who's on first and what's on second sometimes. But yet we see this evil king that slipped away. His dad was a good dad. He had some faults. He started looking around at evil and he thought it was okay. But it wasn't okay because his son, his son was influenced by that evil. Help us, even as we saw that exhortation for Jude that this week that we'll seek to keep ourselves in the love of God. And if there's things coming up in our lives that maybe our eyes are drifting to, maybe some things that we're entertaining that we shouldn't do, Lord, that you would check our heart that we don't go a strain that we don't follow after other things other than you lord we ask that you would give us that singleness of heart and in mind lord we want to pray for those who are sick among us those who weren't able to make it tonight lord that you might bless them that you might strengthen your church and we want to give you the glory in jesus name amen, amen. amen. Thank you for taking part in today's program. We would love to hear from you. You can email us at terryreynolds at agapechapeloc.org. Again, that's terryreynolds at agapechapeloc.org. Or you can write us at Agape Chapel, P.O. Box 4023, Huntington Beach, California, 92647. May God richly bless you.